السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ Can I ask the boys or the brothers at the back of the masjid to come forward? The back of the masjid is for women. Jazakumullah khairan. Leave the back of the masjid for the women. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina Man yahdihillahu fala mudillala wa man yudlil fala hadiyala وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد We began the chapter last week, chapter 28 in Kitab al-Tawheed with the explanation of Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, Sharh al-Mujaz, al-Mumahad, li-Tawheed al-Khaliq, al-Mumajjad, al-Ladhi al-Lafahu, Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala. So this, in short, Sharh al-Mujaz, al-Mumahad of uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, it's a tremendous explanation that is brief, containing huge amounts of benefit. So the chapter was chapter 28 that we embarked upon last week, chapter that which has been narrated concerning tatayyur, or concerning the evil omens. And we mentioned, or the Sheikh, Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, he mentioned several ayat and a hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, ayat from Allah and of course hadith of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam regarding this affair of evil omens. And we went through the chapter or we read the chapter so I'm not going to read that again but you should have it in front of you either in translation or in, or in Arabic and if, you've got, if you're following me in the book then it is page number 212 in the hardback print Manaratul Islam, uh, page 100 or page 213, we're upon now, which is the sharh, the explanation. And anyway, through the sharh or through the explanation itself, you'll get a feel and an idea of what the chapter is talking about anyway. Uh, I think we covered the first paragraph, but I'm just going to quickly read through it again, because it's only a short paragraph. And in the explanation, he mentions that first, the definition of tiyara. He mentions that it is a bad or pessimistic omen. And it is by way of looking at the direction in which birds fly, or in terms of names, that they see that the bird is going in a particular direction and they say this is a bad omen. Or that if they hear, they hear particular names, that they regard that to be bad omens, or particular words, or particular locations, or particular times. As for its ruling, then the ruling of Tiyara is that it is haram. Because the legislation, the Sharia, it forbids evil omens. And it censures those who seek out evil omens. Thirdly, is there anything, any exceptions? Meaning, is there any exceptions that, are, that allow the usage or to take from evil omens. Are there any exceptions? And the answer is no. There is nothing. There are no exceptions to this principle that om, evil omens and seeking them out is forbidden. So these evil omens, the tiyara, which is the pessimistic or bad omen, an evil omen, there is no exception to that. All of them and seeking them is haram. And all of them are blameworthy. As for the statement of the Prophet wasallam, that I am pleased or I am amazed. Naam. I am amazed or pleased. يُعْجِبُنِي الفأل, That the fa'al or the, uh, the good sign is something that amazes me or I am pleased with. Meaning uh, a good sign here as he explains Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi that the fa'al 
here or the good omen, it is a good or a hopeful sign. Naam, it is a good sign or a hopeful sign of something good. And it can be with a good word, with a kalima al hasana, or bil ism al hasan, or with a good name. And Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, when they came to him, Suhail bin Amr, on the day of Hudaybiyah, to negotiate and to draw a contract of peace, and he was from the Mushrikeen, the Prophet وسلم, when he heard his name Suhail, then he said, لَقَدْ سَهُولَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِكُمْ Surely your affair has been made easy. Because his name was Suhail, which indicates ease, then when he heard the name, he, he took that as a good sign, as a hopeful sign. So this is what is intended by Al-Fa'al. This is what is intended by Al-Fa'al. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ, that he was pleased with a good kalima, a kalima hasana, so, in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ was pleased by a good name that he heard. That this was a difficult time for the Muslims at Hudaybiyah because they were prevented from making Umrah. And, of course, they feared that Uthman anhu had been killed and the contract with the Mushrikeen was going to be difficult because of the conditions of the Mushrikeen. So when they sent Suhail, he saw that as a hopeful sign. So that is a good hope. I know sometimes we use the word omen, but omen in the English language has, you know, like uh, connotations, superstitious connotations. But actually, maybe a better word for omen will be a hopeful sign or a sign of goodness that a person perceives because he hears a name or a good word. But, you know, if you want to use the word good omen with that tafsil, then, Allahu alam, there is no harm in that in the English language. Fourthly, he mentions... As for the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla in which he said ala inna ma ta'iruhum wa ta'iruhum inda Allah walakinna aktharahum la ya'lamun indeed their evil omens indeed they uh, na'am indeed their evil omens meaning the 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 evil that befalls them that it is with Allah however many of them or, or most of them, they do not know. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their evil omens, meaning the evil that befalls them. This al-ta'ir is that which has been decreed for you, meaning that which happens to you, and that which is written will happen to you, or befall you, because Allah has already written the deeds of the servants, their actions and their speech, and what will occur for them, meaning in their favor, or that which will happen to them that is harmful to them, against them, then all of it is written in Allah al mahfuz meaning in the preserved tablet that is with Allah. So their evil omens, ala inna ma ta'iruhum inda Allah. Indeed, their, their, their evil omens, meaning the event that befall them, that they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he mentions, Shaykh Ahmed al Najmi rahimahullah, he mentioned, and the meaning of this ayah and what is intended is that which is written and decreed for them, or that which is written which goes against them, meaning befalls them. That all of this is already written and decreed by Allah. It is with Allah already in the wise mention, in Dhikrul Hakim, and in the Loh al Mahfuz. So, already in the preserved tablet, that which was going to happen to you of good has already been written for you. And that which was going to harm you has already been written for you, which is for you and against you. All of this has already been written. So, it is not controlled, Barakallahu Fikum. It is not controlled by omens, meaning evil omens or things that you see or perceive. Rather, it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And he makes that clear as we go on. When he mentions Sheikh, Al- Sheikh Ahmed, in, Ahmed al-Najmi, rahimahullah, he said, the statement of Allah, Azza wa Jal, قَالُوا تَائِرُكُمْ مَعْكُمْ أَإِنْ ذُكِّرْتُمْ بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ that they, the Prophet said, your evil omens be with you. Do you call it evil? Because you are admonished? Rather, you are a transgressing people. So this is the ayah, meaning, Sheikh Ahmed mentioned, rahimahullah, whatever is written, whatever is written, whether for you, whatever is written is for you or against you. No. Whatever is written is for you or against you. And whatever afflicts you, then it is only as a result of what you have earned. Only as a result of what you have earned. وَإِنْ ذُكِّرْتُمْ As Allah mentions, is it because you are admonished? I.e. when you are reminded and you are admonished, you take it as an evil omen instead of an admonishment and as a warning. Instead of taking it as a warning and as an admonition, you take it as an evil omen. Bal antum, qawman musrifun. Rather, you are a transgressing people, Allah mentions with regard to them. So your evil omens are with you. Meaning, of course, and this is the intent here, meaning that Whatever happens to you of evil is because you have earned it yourself. This is what this is why it comes to you. Don't blame it on the omens. Is it because you have been reminded of the truth, and whatever, and and and, and you have been admonished that you, then you blame it upon the evil omens? It's what your own hands have earned. Whatever, 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 naam, whatever has been written for you or against you. And nothing is going to afflict you except that you have earned it yourselves. Then he mentions the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, La adwa, that there is no contagion, meaning there is no spreading of infections and contagious diseases. And there is no evil omen. And there is no hamma. That there is no omen of a night bird or an owl. I will explain. These are obviously things that used to occur in the times of Jahiliyyah amongst the Arab. Wala safar. And there is no evil omen for the month for the for the uh, for the month of Safar. And this has been reported, this hadith, by Imam Bukhari. And then there is an additional wording from Imam Muslim, Wala Noah. And there is no omens in the constellations of the universe or the, or the stars. وَلَا غُولَ And there is no such thing or there is no uh, that, that we do not take and believe in the ghul. وَلَا غول, Meaning the frightful ghosts. What is termed as ghosts. So he mentions Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi explaining this affair. He mentions la adwa, meaning that there is no uh, contagion or the transmission of diseases, meaning that the diseases and the infections do not transmit by themselves. Because this was the belief in Jahiliyyah, which is a belief, of course, even today amongst the Juhal, that the diseases that they spread from person to person or animal to animal or from land to land, by themselves, that they themselves, by themselves they spread. We don't believe this, Barakallahu Feekum. They spread by the will of Allah. They spread by the will of Allah, as we will make clear, inshallah. As for his saying, the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, وَلَا تِيَرَى That there is no evil omens. Meaning, as he, as he mentions, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi explaining, he said, and this is a negation of attira meaning the forbidden omens the forbidden omens meaning the evil omens meaning the 
bad omens that the people that they are deceived by by the flight of birds for example then this does not this has no effect upon a person it has no effect upon him whether regardless of whether the bird it flies it whether it approaches from one direction or another direction or from the right or from the left from the front or from behind it makes no difference in terms of the good or the evil that is going to come upon you has no effect not from the right to the left nor from the left to the right and so on so this has no effect upon the qadr upon the pre decree it has no effect as it relates to the pre decree the pre decree has already been written so looking for it in the flight of birds and how the birds fly meaning that those mushrikeen of course in the times of jahiliya that they used to say that if the bird flies from one direction in to another direction or from the front to the back and so on then this is a sign that you can go ahead and do what you plan to do and if it comes from a different direction then this is a sign of a bad evil omen so don't do it this is of course has no effect upon the pre decree the pre decree is not you know you don't know what is going to happen because of these types of affairs so they have no uh, effect upon the pre decree and they are not and the pre decree does not emanate from this nor do calamities occur because of this and no sadness and grief it is not come from these types of things inna al qadr bi yad Allah for indeed the pre decree is in the hand of Allah he is the one who brings forth the decree as he wishes as he wishes subhanahu wa ta'ala with good or with evil all of this is from the pre decree of Allah is in the with the pre decree of Allah so whoever believes in the effect of in the effect of birds naam the whomsoever believes in the effect of a bird that is released has committed shirk has committed shirk and upon him an obligatory upon him is to repent to Allah and make tauba فهذا نفي للطيارة التي كان أهل الجاهلية يعتقدونها. and this is a negation of the evil omens that the people of Jahiliya they used to believe in. so we don't believe in those evil omens. and of course, different cultures and different nations and different countries have their own versions of them. So they will say, for example, don't walk under a ladder, or if you see a black cat, or if you spill some salt, then throw a pinch over your shoulder. Don't walk under a ladder. Seven years bad luck, and so on. And this is, or other affairs that are similar to this. If you walk out of the house and if you see a particular animal, or if you see a particular type of person, then go back into your house. Or if it is a particular day, because of course. the kuffar they also and and in the times of jahiliya they used to hold that there is a particular day that is a day that is that, uh, that, that has an evil omen in it the kuffar have their own the westerners friday the 13th they have their own days that they say on this day be careful and do not put the the 13th floor in any building like in the united states of america many buildings don't have a 13th floor from the 12th straight to 14 of course it's 13 not that there's a gap of air in between it is still 13 but they don't call it 13 right they call it 12 then 14 you miss out the 13 in many buildings and this is of course has no effect subhanallah these numbers or names that we do not now consider them to be bad omens or evil omens that we are held back from actions or deeds as for the saying of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wala hamma that there is no uh, omen or evil omen of a night bird then the hamma here as he mentioned sheikh ahmed al najmi that the people of jahiliya that they used to believe that if a person was killed wrongly he would he would transform himself into 
a bird that flies in the night, a night bird, or into something else that would demand vengeance. So the text and this word ham, it refers to something that the people of Jahiliya would imagine. And this has, of course, no reality to it. No reality to it. There's no haqiqa to it. And it is said that the word hamma refers to an owl. The evil omen of an owl. It has no reality to it. And you even, you see it now like the black crow. That people say, oh, that's a sign of death. Or something similar to that. Or, or if you see a bat. And this means that there is someone who has come to come from the dead and this you know this this, this vampire genre that is now prevalent that they entice the youth to read those books on vampires then all of this is shirk barakallahu fikum all of this enters under the under the barb of shirk as we will mention later on there is no reality to these and 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 to and to have omens with regard to them and so on this is nothing but the meanderings of the minds of the foolish. As for the saying, and likewise he mentions, is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, Wala safar, that there is no omen in the month of Safar. And he mentioned, and of course, the ancient Romans used to have it also. Like the, month, like the Arabs, they used to have the month of Safar. The ancient Romans used to have the Ides of March. In the month of March, they used to regard it to be a month of bad luck. So they have these kind of months or periods of time, the people of Jahiliya and the people of Kufr, they have them. In Islam, we don't, we say it's a pre-decree, you can't overtake the pre-decree. There's no evil omens in these things. This only takes people away from reliance in Allah. So he mentions that the people of Jahiliya, they used to see bad omens in the month of Safar. So the Prophet ﷺ, he informed them, that the month, there is no evil omen connected to a month. And then rather, this also applies to all of the other months. So the people, they used to also take bad omens in particular days. Like for example, the Wednesday. The last Wednesday of every month, the Arabs of Jahiliya used to regard it to be a, a day of bad omens. The last Wednesday of every month. Like the Kuffar, they have it. You know, the Arabs have theirs, the Westerners have theirs, the Romans had theirs, the Greeks had theirs, the Hindus have theirs. But some of the Muslims, they are deceived by these. You know, because this is the way of the movies and the soap operas and stories and tales that they read, that they are deceived by them. They are deceived by them. Don't be deceived, subhanAllah. Don't be deceived and don't waste your time watching rubbish like that anyway. So, he mentions that they used to believe that this was a, that this day, meaning the last Wednesday of every month, that it was a day of continual bad luck. Every last Wednesday. So you can imagine those Arabs of Jahiliya. What day is it tomorrow? Wednesday. Last Wednesday? Last Wednesday. Khalas, stay in your house. Don't leave. Don't go out because something might happen to you. This is not from our deen. This is from the from the times of Jahiliya. Whoever believes in these types of things, even in our times, whether it be the last Wednesday, or whether it be Friday the 13th, whether it be walking under a ladder, whether it be a particular name. Like a brother came to me and he said, you know, I named my son with a particular name. And I noticed, and it was a good name from the Quran, something, and, and I can't remember which prophet or... Anyway, it was a name, Allahu Alam Ilyas or something like this. And he said, you know what, I named him, and a week after, my son got eczema. And my relatives told me, this is the bad omen in the name. Yeah, Akhi, should I change the name? Because they say if you change the name, his skin will get better. Shuf. This is someone praying in this masjid. Because of the deception that is peddled by the people of superstition. They will come to you and say to you, don't name your, na- don't name your son with a good name. Even if it's a good name. They don't name him Nuh. Don't name him. Oh, we noticed that when we named him Nuh, name of a prophet. 
or Ilyas, or Zakaria, or anything like Abdul Rahman, or Abdullah, or Al Harith. Say, oh, I noticed that I named him that name. He was fine before that. And now my family is saying, he's Nick because of that name. Because there was a, your great uncle, he was named with that name, and when they changed his name, the eczema went away. Jahl. Ignorance. There's no bad omens in these types of things. Subhanallah. So they used to say, also, the Arabs of Jahiliya, that, thir- that, that, that the Wednesday, in, uh, the, oh, that, the, uh, that the last Wednesday in every month, that it is the day upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the destructive wind that destroyed the people of Ad. So they used to regard, therefore, that Wednesday, they say it was the last Wednesday of a month that Allah sent the wind that destroyed the people of Ad. So therefore, they used to take it, take that day as a day of a bad omen. They used to take it as a day of bad omen. And of course, all of this is batil. Then there's an increase in the wording, or there's additional wording reported by Imam Muslim in his Sahih, that the Prophet wasallam said, and there is no omens, evil omens in the constellations of the stars or the heavenly uh, planets and stars and so on and the moon. And nor in ghosts or what is referred to as ghosts. Meaning, Sheikh Ahmed mentioned, Rahimahullah, that the constellations, they are not the ones. It is not. By looking into the constellations of the stars and the movement of the moon and the, and the celestial bodies, it is not in their movements that you find the withholding of rain or the coming of the rain. It is not in that. When you say, oh, because the, the stars have done this and done that, we're not going to get rain. Oh, we are. No, it is not because of this. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is He who brings the rain. It is he who withholds the rain. And as for the ghul, which is translated as, maybe loosely translated as ghosts, then, Sheikh Ahmed and Najmi, he mentioned, then this is what is seen by a person in the darkness of the nights. In the darkness of night, the people say that they have seen a ghost. And it also is that which causes the travelers to get lost upon their journeys. And sometimes it is accompanied by that which is referred to as Sa'ali. Sa'ali. And the Sa'ali, as he mentions from Ibn al-Athir, in his Nihaya, and Nihaya fi gharib al-Hadith wal-Athar, he mentions they are the magicians of the jinn. And the ghul, this is Ibn, Ibn al-Athir, and the ghul have no ability to frighten. They have no ability to frighten. It's you that's being frightened. You are becoming frightened. It is not it that is frightening you. It has no ability to frighten or to misguide or to lose the traveler as he travels. However, amongst the jinn, they are magicians, just as they are magicians amongst humans, and they use deception and guile and illusions. Then he mentioned, then he mentioned, Sheikh Ahmed, rahimahullah, that the ghul, that the ghul is a, is a type, a category from the shayateen. That come upon the traveler to get him lost in the night. So he's upon a journey and he deceives him and causes him to get lost upon his journey. However, there occurs in a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, If you are frightened by the ghosts of the jinn, then rush to make the adhan, then race. To make the adhan, call the adhan. Because obviously, what happens when you call the adhan? What runs away? Shayateen. So they race away from you. Because they can't take the kalima la ilaha illallah and the takbir of Allah 
and the dhikr of Allah. They can't tolerate it. This is why any time you fear the jinn or you fear harm, that's why you mention and you recite the words of Allah from the book of Allah, Ayatul Kursi, or the two quls, the mu'awwidatan at the end of the Qur'an, or you make isti'adha with Allah, that you seek refuge with Allah, and other than that. Why? Because the jinn, they can't tahammal or yatahammal. They can't take the burden of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he, anyway, he mentions this hadith, even though the hadith is weak, but the meaning is correct anyway. Because the dhikr is like a fortress. And seeking refuge in Allah is like a fortress that protects you. So that narration is, is weak, as Shaykh al-Albani mentioned, but nevertheless, its meaning is correct. Then he mentions the hadith, and, and, and of course, you know, going back to the issue of ghosts, because obviously, this is another thing that is common. If you've been born and raised in the Western lands, then right from an early age, they start teaching about ghosts and poltergeists and all types of beings that are floating around with white sheets over their bodies and you know, bed sheets and traveling around the earth and so on. Then we say, not to say that you that these occurrences and these visions aren't seen. They are seen. But as our belief, Ahlul Sunnah, we believe that these are from the beguilements and the deceptions of the shayateen. They do not themselves have an ability to frighten. If you become frightened, then you have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust in Allah that they can't harm you. And they can cause you no benefit and no harm. Because that which has been written for you will happen to you. So don't be deceived by them and don't be scared by them. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Sheikh Ahmed mentioned, that narration, though it is da'if, but the meaning is correct, that if you are frightened by these occurrences, then call the adhan. Call upon Allah. Declare Allah's tawheed. Declare the greatness of Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What are you? You are nothing but an insignificant creation of Allah. So Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. What harm can you do to me? Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater, greater than you. So these jinn and these devils and these ghouls and whatever else form that they take, because the jinn can take forms, of course, that they may come to the people in a form and you think that I saw, you know, I saw a, 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 a person who died a thousand years ago, but you didn't see him. That I saw such and such a person who lived in the 14th century and they say that he inhabits this old castle. And if you go in there a particular time of the month or in a particular time of the year, you see him floating and you can see visions of him. These are jinn. These are jinn. These are the ghul. These are the shayateen. And they may be even be the magicians from the shayateen. And they take forms and they take, you know, certain types of, uh, uh, of beguilement and deception that they deceive the people with. But we are not deceived by them. And nor should we be deceived by them. Nor should we take them as any evil omen. That now you're going to stop me from traveling through a land because of these, these types of affairs. Or I'm not going to go to the shop because someone said that on such and such a day of every month that these ghouls, they come out. No. We are not deceived by them, barakallahu feekum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. And there's no power, no movement except by Allah. So do not be afraid. Rather trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believer is strong. And he does not feel tremors. And he does not doubt his Lord. None of these things can harm. Look at Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. When shaitan came to, to, to steal from the, from the zakatul fitr. When he came to steal from the zakat and he took him. He wasn't afraid of him. The Prophet sallallahu himself, he wasn't afraid of them. What harm can they do you? Except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written. It doesn't mean now that you go and you interfere with their lives. No, you don't go and interfere and, and prod and interfere with the, with the communities of the jinn. Just like you wouldn't interfere with communities of, of other human beings, interfere with them and cause them mischief. You wouldn't do that. 
But as for them approaching you, that these are ghul and these are ghosts and these are things that are entering into your home and whatever, then you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you seek refuge in Allah. And then he mentions from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there is no contagion, that there is no spreading of diseases by themselves, yarhamak Allah. And there is no evil omens. And then the Prophet sallallahu said that I am pleased by a good sign or a good omen. So they said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا الْفَأَلْ And what is the good omen? He said, الْكَلِمَةُ tayyiba. Then it is a good word. A good omen is a good word. Meaning, Shaykh Ahmed he said, rahimahullah, that the meaning of these words is لا adwa, that there is no contagion meaning there is no disease that transfers from one to another by itself. No disease come, moves from one person to another by itself as the kuffar they believe. And Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala in a silsila when he, when he covers this hadith he really speaks against these people. He said these ignoramuses who have no intellect and they don't understand these types of affairs and that they enforce upon the people that the infections they spread by themselves and this is from their ignorance and their misguidance that they believe this and from the examples my brothers and sisters is as I mentioned last week that sometimes there is a plague that stretches across a whole nation or a whole city yet you will find in a household in a household, there are five people who are affi- uh, afflicted. And maybe one person or two people, they are looking after them, yet nothing happens to them. Nothing happens to them. So why didn't the infection spread to them? If the infection spreads by itself, and the disease it spreads by itself, then why is it that in a household you find two or three people that they have some plague upon them or some disease? Maybe even some fatal disease like bubonic plague or something like this. Yet, the mother survives and the baby survives. The father he dies, the sister dies, the brother dies, the grandfather dies. These two survive. Why? Why didn't the infection come to them? Because the infection does not move except by the will of Allah. It doesn't enter a person except by the will of Allah. So we don't believe that the infections, they go by themselves. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the will of Allah. And he mentions, Shaykh Ahmed al Najmi, that there is no contagion that transfers from one person to another by itself. And the evil omen has no effect in the affairs of a servant except that which he imagines or falsely perceives in himself. And it is reported about al Adwa, meaning about the contagion. Then Allah's Messenger وسلم, was asked about the camel that roams in the sand like an antelope or a deer. But when an infection when infected when an infected mangy camel with scabs mixes with them, they all become affected with mange. So he asked the Prophet وسلم, about this. So the Prophet وسلم, said in response to him. Then who conveyed, meaning who infected the first camel with mange then? How did the first camel get it? So the hadith report report by Bukhari and Muslim, meaning that the people they perceive that when one camel who is healthy and he is amongst a herd of healthy camels and then an infected camel is introduced amongst them, the Sahabi, he said to the Prophet Wasallam, look, this one camel entered amongst them and all of them became infected. So what's the intent here? Is what is infecting those camels? Look at that camel. That camel must be by itself, infection carried from one to another by itself. So the Prophet Wasallam, in response, he said, no. If that is the case, then who infected the first camel that ever got infected? How did it come to it? Because it came from somewhere, right? So therefore, the infection does not travel by itself. 
It is by the will of Allah. So then he mentions al-muhim, meaning anyway, what is important is that these narrations that contain a negation or forbiddance in believing in contagion, moving by itself and traveling by itself and infecting by itself and believing in evil omens, the tiyara, and in the omens of birds, meaning of the night birds, of the owls and so on, the hamma, and in the bad luck that is perceived by the people of Jahiliya in the month of Safar, then these hadith, they contain with them, from Allah's Messenger wasallam, the remedy from that which is rooted and established in the hearts of the mushrikeen, of wicked beliefs. So they had these beliefs, and they were fearful of them, of these evil omens. So when they entered into Islam, they remained something in the early, in, in the early days of these beliefs. So the Prophet ﷺ remedied them by, clarif- by clarifying to them that these affairs, that these beliefs have no effect in themselves. Rather the one who has an effect upon the creation is Allah. And these texts, these hadith, negate any effect of these things that they by themselves and independently that they have an effect. No, they don't. So the Messenger وسلم, guided them with his saying when he said to them that if any of you sees something that he dislikes, then let him say, Allahumma la ya'ti bil hasanat illa anta. Wala yadfa' as sayyat illa anta. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa bika. That if some, someone sees something that he dislikes, then let him say, O oh Allah, there is no good that comes except from you. There is no good except you. And there is no repelling of, of evil except from you. And there is no movement, no power except with you. So this is what he said. So a person is clear in his mind. It does not happen except by the will and power of Allah. And then likewise the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud where the Prophet ﷺ said, At-tiyaratu shirkun. And he repeated it twice. Evil omens are shirk. Evil omens are shirk. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that there is not any of us, or there is not one of us except who feels something. However, Allah causes it to go away with tawakkul, with reliance in Allah. So this is the remedy for that which afflicts the souls of ill feelings and evil omens and evil feelings that you may sense and the fear of the future. You see something and you fear the future. How do you remedy that? You don't believe in it and you put your trust in Allah, tawakkul, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person feels something in himself, then let him say, Allahumma la ya'ti bil hasanat illa anta. Oh Allah, there is no coming of goodness except from you. So a person, he makes dua to Allah. So he doesn't believe in evil omens. And he doesn't allow his soul to be deceived by something that he sees, a black cat or something like this. And he fears therefore the future. If he feels something in himself, then he remedies that. How? Allahumma la ya'ti bil hasanat illa anta. Oh Allah, no one comes with good except you. Or yaqul, or that he says, Allahumma la khayra illa khayruk. Oh Allah, there is no goodness except your goodness. Wa la tayra illa tayruk. And there is no decree except for your decree. Wa la ilaha ghayruk. And there is no deity worthy of worship besides you. And he, the Prophet wasallam, explained in the hadith of Ibn Amr that whoever is turned back from fulfilling his need due to what he perceives to be an evil omen has committed shirk. I.e. he has fallen into shirk. 
He has fallen into a branch of idolatry. So for example, if a person goes out upon a journey and he comes across the screeching or the crying of a crow or of a fox or of an owl and so on, then he decides not to go out and he comes back without carrying out what he needed to carry out. So he is repelled by this evil omen. If he was to do that, then he has committed shirk. He has fallen into something of polytheism, of idolatry. And of course, this is not the same. A person may say, well, what if I go out into the desert or into the jungle and I hear the roaring of a lion? That's different. You run back. Right, you run back. Why? Because the roaring of a lion is something tangible. If you don't run back, you're stupid, huh? Because the lion now physically can harm you. But the crowing of a, a person says, well, I heard the crowing or the screaming or the screeching of a crow. And that's a bad sign. So I'm not going to go out now. I'm not going to continue this journey. No, that's haram. And he has fallen into a branch of shirk. Obviously, if you go out and you hear now, you know, a whole group of wolves or dogs, wild dogs or a lion roaring, that's different. Now you have to take that into account because they may harm you. Because this is now a physical creature that is going to harm you. But as for seeing evil omens, I, I came out and I saw a, a bird flying in from right to left across the horizon. And the elder women in my village, they used to say, that if you see a bird, a black bird that flies from right to left or left to right, as you leave your home, then this is a bad omen that something bad is going to happen to you today. So then you go back into the house. Haram. This is a branch from the branches of shirk. So then he mentions, and there, therefore what is taken from, from this, meaning from this chapter, is that that which befalls the heart, meaning of fear, from the outset, from its beginning, it has no effect. If a person confronts that feeling with tawakkul in Allah, with reliance, and trust in Allah and relying upon Him. And by believing that these created things are weak. They're weak. And they have no effect upon the pre-decree. And they have no knowledge regarding that which will benefit or harm you. How does that crow know that tomorrow, that because I've, 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 I flew from right to left, I've tricked you know Abdullah and Bakr and Zaid? How does the crow know? You walk out of your house, you see a black cat. How does the black cat know what, what effect it has upon your future? It's you that thinks it has an effect upon you. The cat has my skin, doesn't know anything. So, he mentions some lines of poetry which can be roughly translated as, By your Lord, you will not know the strikers or those who harm by the casting of pebbles. Nor will you know what Allah has decreed by the scaring of birds. This is not how you're going to know. Barakallahu feekum. Or what Allah has created by way of that. You will not know it by these, by these things. So the believer relies upon Allah. And that is a very rough translation. Because poetry is not easy. So the believer relies upon Allah. And he puts his trust in him. An advice to my brothers. From Shaykh Al-Fawzan, Hafidhullah. And from the scholars. If you have music upon your phones as a ringtone, it is haram. It is haram because you have put it on there, number one. So you have done something haram. Secondly, that now you want others to encounter the haram that you've put on your phone so they have to listen to the haram. Thirdly, even worse than that, an, an additional compounded sin is that you come into a house of Allah of worship and then you allow and you put in front of the people this music as they are reciting the words of Allah and the hadith of Allah's Messenger وسلم, or that the Imam is reciting. And wallahi, there's very few things that are more off-putting that you are praying and you are listening to the Imam reciting Surah Al-Fatiha or something from Surah Al-Baqarah or something from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a ring, musical ringtone goes off 
in the pocket of another person. A song that he's put on his, onto his phone. Do you not fear Allah, my brothers and sisters? Do you not have the taqwa of Allah and the khawf of Allah enough to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden this affair? And that the salaf, the likes, and the sahaba radiallahu anhum, that they used to regard the music and the, and the musical instruments to be the flutes of shaitan, so much so that they used to call it, they used to call music the Qur'an of shaitan. The words of Allah of the Qur'an of the believers. And music is the Qur'an of shaitan. And you bring this Qur'an of shaitan into the house of Allah, and you have no khawf, you have no fear of Allah, do you not think that Allah is going to call you to account? Fear Allah. If you have musical ringtones, remove them from your phones. Allah will call you to account. And you will remember this day that I told you, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, if you do not remove it. You will not be able to say, I did not know. You know. Do not bring music into the house of Allah. In fact, don't have any, anything to do with music. Not in your own homes and not even the house of Allah. In conclusion, he mentions, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Al-Najmi. So the believer relies upon Allah and he puts his trust in him. He knows that whatever, that whatever befalls him, was never going to miss him. And whatever missed him, was never going to befall him. And then he makes a dua to Allah, Oh Allah, give us success in that which you love. Meaning give us success and guide us to that which you love and are pleased with. And keep us away from the misguidance of the tribulations. Ya Rabbal Alameen, O Lord of the worlds. Allahumma Ameen. And upon that we finish this chapter. Jazakumullah khairan. And don't forget the sisters tomorrow. The sisters class is at 11 o'clock in the morning. Barakallahu feekum. So it is important that your wives and your daughters that they learn these affairs. So send them inshallah. And come with them if you wish. No problem. Barakallahu feekum. Wa subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.